everyone. So good to see you guys are here. Would you turn to Philippians chapter 3 this morning? Philippians chapter 3. We're going to be reading verses 17 through 21. Thank you so much. Praise team. Thank you, Amanda. I am a citizen of heaven, and we find that in Philippians 3, 17 through 21, so let's do that together. Brethren, join in following my example and observe those who walk according to the pattern you have in us. For many walk of whom I have told you, often told you, and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross, whose end is destruction, whose God is their appetite, and whose glory is in their shame who set their mind on earthly things, for our citizenship is in heaven, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory by the exertion of the power that he has, even to subject all things to himself. Let's ask for the Lord's blessing this morning on his word. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you that it, you have preserved it throughout the ages, and that we have a copy of it today, this morning with us, Lord, the most powerful presence on earth, your word. What a blessing for us, what a humbling, humbling to us, Lord, that we have a copy of your word today, most powerful, powerful to transform lives, powerful to give us eternal life. We ask for your blessing on your word. We know you're faithful in administering the word to us, and so we ask for your blessing. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. To start with this morning, notice that Paul express, explicitly expresses who we are in Christ in verse 20. If we are in Christ, then we are citizens of heaven. That's who we are in Christ. This is our 11th sermon on who I am in Christ. This morning, I am a citizen of heaven. And so if we are in Christ, then we are citizens of heaven. And this is the premise of this morning's message, that if we are in Christ, if we are in Christ, then we are citizens of heaven. We're already there. Our, our names are already written, written down in the registration there in heaven. It's not, it's not waiting for us to get there. We're already there. Amen? As Paul says there, for our citizenship is in heaven. He, he's talking about it currently at the time he was saying that. That is where it's at. So in Paul's day, talking about citizenship, in Paul's day, Roman citizenship was highly valued. Everybody wanted to be a Roman citizen, if they could. And they were based, there were basically three ways a person could obtain Roman citizenship. Two were legal, one was illegal, and some people were doing that. But you'd have to be born a Roman, of course. Paul was born a Roman. Uh, you could purchase Roman citizenship, but that was, it wasn't really for sale, and it was actually illegal. You couldn't do it, but people did it. And the reason why it was illegal is because it would foster corruption, as you can imagine. People would be buying Roman citizenship at exorbitant prices. People would be trying to sell it. Those who, those who are in government, you can't buy U.S. citizenship. You can be born into it or you can be naturalized into it. But I think you can serve in the military, too, in the U.S. military and get your citizenship that way. It was that way when I was young. But you can't buy it. And that's how it was in Rome, too. You could also, uh, if you wanted to become a Roman citizen... Uh, You could serve in the military, but it was a 25-year hitch. 25 years in the military if you wanted to be a Roman citizen. That tells you how great the value was. That's how much Romans or or non-Romans valued Roman citizenship. They would be willing to spend 25 years in military service as a Roman soldier in order to have that service. Crazy if you think about it. And so a Roman citizen was, was highly valued because of the benefits that it gave people. I'll give you a list of some of the benefits just in case you're wondering what what drew people to Roman citizenship. Number one, you could vote. You could be able to vote. That's important, huh? Power of the people, a desire to vote, want to vote. If you want to vote here in America, you got, you got to be a citizen. Is that true? It's true. Uh, you could hold political office. You could have the rights of appeal. You could have property rights if you were a Roman citizen. You can have business or trading rights. You can be free from torture or certain types of execution like uh, crucifixion. Paul didn't, when, Paul was, uh, when Paul was put to death, he didn't get crucifixion. He got the axe because he was a Roman. He didn't hang on, hang on a cross for days and die in that way. And so you can be uh, exempt from certain types of 
of uh, torture and certain types of execution. A Roman citizen could make a will and he could inherit property. He could do that. Uh, be able to marry and divorce under Roman law. That's a privilege, right? So these were some of the things that gave Roman citizenship its value. Now the Greek word for citizenship here in verse 20 means a member of a free state or a free society. And can literally be translated a commonwealth. And we've all heard terms like that, a commonwealth. You've heard that term before. That's kind of what it means. The word commonwealth itself in its earliest form meant uh, common well-being or common good. And common in the context of heaven means equal belonging. Everybody belongs to heaven equally. Me, Mark, uh, Mickey, Janie, we're all going to be in heaven together. We're all going to own heaven, kind of inherit heaven, kind of equally. So in the context of heaven, it means equal belonging. In heaven, everyone will share or have in common a sense of well-being beyond the imagination. Beyond the imagination. A lot of people want to come to the U.S. because they want that. They want the American dream. They want to be able to to inherit that, be able to work for it, be able to have it, the American dream. You know, three bedrooms, two bathrooms, two-car garage. That's the basic, right? That's the minimum of the American dream. White picket fence. In some places, it's chain link. But anyways, everyone will share or have in common a sense of well-being beyond imagination. Far better than any human citizenship. That's what Paul's getting at here. In, in context, Roman citizenship Roman citizenship is nothing compared to heavenly citizenship. Amen. This in itself was great value, that had great value attached to it. Um, what, what gives heavenly citizenship its value? Well, a lot, and I wanted to give you some of that this morning. What gives um, heavenly citizenship its value? Well, listen, and you'll learn. It says this, first and foremost, it's where the Lord dwells. That's what gives heaven its greatest value. God is there, amen? It's the abode of the triune Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And heaven is illuminated and filled with the glory of God. His uh, holiness, his sinlessness, his purity, his majesty, his greatness, his power, his authority, his omniscience, his omnipotence, his om omnipresence, all that he is comes together where he dwells and, and it bursts forth with blinding glory. This itself gives heaven its value way before anything else. Way before any benefit that we might gain by being a citizen of heaven. Way before any selfish reason why we might want to go to heaven. We have reasons why we want to go to heaven, right? Some of our loved ones are there. We want to go because of that. Or as it says in Revelation 21.4, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. and There will be no, no longer <clears throat> be any death. There will be no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. For these things have passed away. Those are reasons why we might want to go to heaven, right? Get rid of that ache that we feel every morning when we get up. The reality every day that we're getting older and we're getting more stiff. Can't wait to get to heaven. The other day I was um, just waking up and I could feel from the years of construction all that misery in my body, you know, my bones. And I just thought, man, what construction did to me, what it's going to be like to be without this body even if it's just going to be temporarily without this body, what it might be like in heaven. Amen? So those are some of the reasons. So way before any escape from curse, from the curse of the fall of man, the curse of sin which is on the earth, to be in the presence of God, when we think about that, without reservation, is itself priceless. And is what gives heaven its value and its reason to rejoice for those who are citizens of heaven. David longed, to be in the Lord's presence. In Psalms 84.10, he says, For a day, one day, in your presence, in your courts, is better than a, than a thousand outside. Can you imagine that? To be, to, in, to be in a place where just one day would be better than a thousand anywhere else? And the prophet Isaiah, seeing the Lord's presence in a vision, shuddered with an overwhelming, devastating sense of his sin before the holiness of God. And he said, Woe is me, for I am, I am ruined I am undone. I am broken. Because I am a man of unclean lips and I live among a people of unclean lips for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. In fact, Isaiah gives us a glimpse of what heaven is like. Let's go there. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 6, if you will. 
Isaiah chapter 6. It gives us a pretty good idea. It gives us a glimpse of the throne room of God, which is what heaven is about. Amen? The greatest value of heaven, the throne room of God and all his glory. Now, try, to, try to keep in mind these are human terms. This is a, a fallen man, Isaiah, although a great prophet of God in the Old Testament, a fallen man who has been allowed to see the throne room of God, and he's going to describe to us what he has seen. Isaiah 6, 1. In the year of King Uzziah's death, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, lofty and exalted, with the train of his robe, filling the temple. Seraphim stood, these are angels, seraphim stood above him, each having six wings. With two he covered his faith. face, with two he covered his feet, with two he flew, and one called out to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory, and the foundations of the thresholds tremble at the voice of him who called out with the temple, was feeling with smoke. And then I said, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips. I live among a people of unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then... One of the seraphim flew to me with a burning coal in his hand, which he had taken from the altar with tongs. He touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, and your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is forgiven. Now, just, just in this passage alone, we, we learn so much about our heavenly home. So much. The presence of the Lord sitting on a throne, lifted up, Imagine that in your mind. If, if, if this were the, the heavenly dwelling place of God and, and God would be here and his, his throne would be up high, exalted, up. As the angel saw him, as Isaiah saw him, <clears throat> and lofty and exalted with the train of his robe filling the temple. You see that? You've seen uh, when, when women get married, some of them have these really super long trains on their dress and it covers half the... Uh, Half the aisle as they're coming down. Have you ever seen something like that? You're just you know, amazingly long. Well, this, this train, this robe filled the whole temple. As it came down off of him, it filled the temple. Amazing when you think about it. The absence of sin, the presence of his holiness, causing the angels to cry out in a three-time chorus, Holy, holy, holy is <clears throat> the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. You know, in this passage, we see the ministry of the angels as they minister in the presence of the Lord. Verse 2, Seraphim stood above him. Okay, above him. So you have the Lord highly and exalted, and then above him are the angels. Picture that in your mind. Angels above him, Seraphim. They have six wings. You can imagine how they get six wings attached to the back of their body, but they've got these six wings. Two and two and two and two and two, four, six. These six wings, as it says, having six wings. With two he covered his feet, because he dare not... Or it covers his face because he dare not even or could not even look upon the holiness of God, which was a, a rare privilege allotted to Isaiah alone. The angels with their wings covered their eyes so they wouldn't look upon the glory of God and his holiness. But Isaiah was being allowed to do that. Two, he covered his feet as a gesture of great lowliness and humility. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Jesus lowered himself or humbled himself to the point of washing his disciples' feet. You remember that. And uh, feet were considered unclean because of how they were used. Today we cover our feet up. At least most of the time we do, unless we're in the house. Don't, wear, don't go outside without shoes on. You'll end up stepping on a bee and get a swollen foot. But they didn't, a lot of times they didn't have shoes. Or if they did, they were just flat bottoms with some straps and their feet would get really dirty and they would walk in all kinds of muck. And the Lord humbled himself, got down right after the supper, took off their sandals, washed their feet in humility. In humility. And so, feet were considered dirty. Even today, feet can get pretty smelly, right? So, covering the feet depicted humility and the holy presence of God. And then one more thing. I don't know if you remember, but uh, Moses was on top of the mountain with the Lord. The glory of God was there in the form of a burning bush. And what did the Lord say to Moses? Take off your sandals. Take off your sandals. Another gesture of humility involving the feet. 
And then with two, he flew, depicting the angel's service to the Lord, all showing the angels, you know, they're covering their eyes, covering their feet, and flying, all of this <clears throat> showing the angels' homage to or worship of the Lord. This passage also depicts the voice of the Lord shaking the foundation of the temple, demonstrating the power of his word and his authority when he speaks. Can't imagine that. I've, I've stood by, um, by rushing water before. Have you ever been by a, a, a large waterfall or a, 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 a flash flood that's coming through? I remember Palm Desert, every once in a while when it would rain a lot, the uh, washes would fill up and they had these tumultuous floods that would come through there and it just roared and roared. It would shake you when you got close to it. Sometimes the ocean will do that when you stand on the beach. You ever notice that? It'll roar and kind of you can feel it in your chest. And this is what we're seeing here as God begins to speak. This amazing power, shaking the foundation of the temple, demonstrating the power of his word. And as I said earlier, we see Isaiah shrinking in fear because of what he sees over his utter sinfulness in the presence of the Lord's glory. And then we see something amazing about heaven in verse 6 and 7. I don't know if you noticed it or not. We see a demonstration of the Lord's goodness and his grace. Always, always seeing this in the scriptures. This is a matter of it's Old Testament or New Testament. Always seeing the goodness and the mercy and the grace of God. It says, one of the seraphim flew to Isaiah with a burning coal in his hand, which he'd taken from the altar with tongs. He touched Isaiah's mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity is taken away, and your sins are forgiven. This is so Isaiah could, ten, could, could continue in the presence of God. He was already overcome by his unholiness, his sinfulness, his wickedness. He said that, Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm fallen, I'm sinful. I cannot stand the presence of God. I cannot. And so this allows him to finish the vision without coming apart because the Lord had cleansed his sin, illustrating, no doubt, the only means by which we gain access into heaven, that is the cleansing of our sin. Amen? It's the only way we can get in. Oh, to be in the presence of God without reservation is itself priceless. And so the greatest value of our citizenship in heaven, then, is the glory of the Lord. I can't think of any greater value, any greater, Bigger reason why I might want to go to heaven and can't wait to get there. Yeah, I've got loved ones there. Yes, it's a place where I'm not going to have any pain in my body. No more tear, no more sorrow. But God is there. God is there. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul said this about the greatness and value of heaven. He had taken a trip, if you remember. He had taken a trip there, the very same place that Isaiah was. You know, don't get me wrong. Uh, the same place that Isaiah was, that's where Paul was at. Same place. Hadn't changed in 2,000 years or 800 years, whatever, whatever that was. I think it was 800 years. Hadn't changed much in 800 years. He said that he had heard inexpressible words. The NASB says that New American Standard says, inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. Now, if you remember from last week, this trip to heaven resulted in one of the main reasons, this is what I believe, one of the main reasons why Paul suffered so much, this trip to heaven. Uh, the suffering was designed to keep him humble because of this vast revelation that he said he had had. He talked about that because of the loftiness of the heavenly experience. And, and in that experience, Paul hears a language not known to men. Things that, things that he was not allowed to repeat, even if he could repeat it, how do you repeat something? In, how do you repeat a language that you don't know? You hear it. How do you put it in the English words? And even if he could, he wasn't permitted to. He wasn't allowed to. There's obviously things about heaven that the Lord hasn't revealed to us through his word, and he won't. And only a few select individuals have been privileged to be privy to that. One of them was Isaiah. The other one was Paul. Both of them were specifically chosen by God as a unique instrument of the Lord for his glory. And I just kind of put a side note here. Unlike the false teachers of, of today, and unlike, obviously, the false teachers of Paul's day, and there were a lot of them in Paul's day, just like there's a lot of them today, unlike those false teachers always making sensational claims about being visited by the Lord, and you've heard those, 
A lot of those televangelists make these sensational claims. I, if, you, if you're on my Facebook, you saw that one video I put out. Maybe you didn't. About these people that make these wild claims about seeing God, being in the presence of God, being touched by God, on and on and on. I remember a, a co-worker of mine one time uh, claiming to see the face of God, claiming to touch the face of God, claiming to be in a vision and reaching out and touching the face of God. He, he claimed that. And I said, what was your re reaction? He said, I just reached out and touched his face. I said, that's funny. Everybody that was in that presence fell to their face, although they were dead. Are you sure what you saw was God? A lot of people making claims like that. Paul's day, today, standing in his presence in heaven, going on and on and on about their, experiencing, about their experience and what they experience, heaping glory upon themselves. Because of that, implying that they must be very special spiritually to have had such an experience. Conversely, Paul says very little about what happened to him. He made it brief with very little detail, especially concerning himself. He even made it sound like he was speaking to a man that he knew. He says, I, I knew a man once 14 years ago. Well, come on, this happened 14 years ago. He'd never talked about it until right now, 14 years later. So he made it sound like he was speaking of another man so that it wouldn't appear as though he was bragging on himself. In fact, after the 14 years, he speaks of it, and then he never speaks of it again. He mentions it one time, very briefly, in 2 Corinthians 12, and then he never speaks about it again. As a matter of fact, he says that, that he wasn't permitted to elaborate, even if he could find the words to do so. But notice the passage with me in 2 Corinthians. Are you in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Notice verse 1. Boasting is necessary, though it's not profitable. Now, He's making this in reference of the previous chapter. In the previous chapter, Paul had been speaking about his suffering and boasting in that, boasting in his suffering. That's what he was talking about. Because that suffering gave the Lord glory. Remember when he said, when I am weak, I am, then I am strong? He gave that glory to the Lord. That's what he was doing. He was boasting in that. And so here, he says he will go on boasting in order to give the Lord glory. But he doesn't see it as a profitable thing for him. That's what he says. I, I've got to go on. It's necessary. It's not profitable for me. I don't, I don't get enjoyment out of this. I don't. I'm not wanting to puff myself up. And so he says he'll go on boasting in order to give the Lord glory, and he doesn't see it very profitable for him. In other words, he'd rather not, but because he's under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he, and the Lord is guiding him to do it, he does it. He probably didn't want to tempt the Corinthians to overdo what he said. They had a fascination for such claims coming from the false prophets. They were glorying in that stuff. They loved to hear that kind of talk when the false prophets would get up and say, yeah, I saw God, I saw a vision, I saw this, and they would boast and boast and boast about these experiences, and the, and the Corinthians were caught up in that. And so Paul spoke of this particular vision out of concern for the Corinthians. He obviously wanted them to see him as a vile viable apostle. In other words, they, they, they were saying, well, <clears throat> have you had visions like these other apostles? Have you seen God like these other apostles? Then you're not an apostle. So Paul says, so they'd once again trust his words. He says in verse 1, I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. In other words, if I have to boast, if that's what it takes for you to listen, then let me tell you this. Let me tell you this. And then, so he says, I know a man in Christ Verse 2, a Christian, who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a man was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, God knows, was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words which a man is not permitted to speak. This is probably why Paul never spoke about it. This is probably why Paul never said anything about it, because he was told when you go back down, don't say anything. Keep it to yourself. Whether he was out of the body or in the body, he doesn't know. It doesn't matter. So there are obviously things about heaven that the Lord hasn't revealed to us through his word, and he won't. And only a few select individuals have been privileged to be privy to that. And it's something that a true man of God wouldn't boast about anyways. That's what point that Paul's talking about here. A true man of God wouldn't put himself up at that level. 
and boast about these things if it really did happen. Um, Paul was pressed to it out of necessity, and that's the only reason why he spoke of it. Well, let's go back to Philippians chapter 3. 20 and 21. When Paul spoke of citizenship, those he wrote to, no doubt, attached the value of Roman citizenship to what Paul was saying whenever he spoke about citizenship. That's probably why he used the term citizen there, because people so highly valued Roman citizenship, and he wanted to use it as a comparison to the value of heavenly citizenship. And so they, no doubt, attached value of the Roman citizenship to what Paul was saying, yet there's a much greater citizenship than Roman citizenship that the Christian possesses. And Paul says it here, for our, he means the Christian, okay? Our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. If you don't have Roman citizenship, it's okay. If you're a slave in Rome's market and you're not, a, and you're not a, a, in Rome's economy, in, in Rome, Roman culture, and you don't have citizenship, it's okay because you have a greater citizenship. So as a desirous and coveted Roman citizenship was in that day, it paled in comparison to being a member of the free state of heaven. That's what Paul's saying here. That's his point. A lot of people boasted about Roman citizenship, but our citizenship, the Christian citizenship, is in heaven. We can boast about being an American citizen. There was a time when everybody wanted to be an American citizen. I think that's still true. That's why they're going to build a wall. Mexico's going to build it, by the way. All right? They're going to pay for it. But that's why they want to build a wall. Everybody's trying to get in. Everybody wants to get in. Some for good reasons, some for bad reason. Everybody wants to get in. And I, I would imagine if we stood in front of Walmart, because that's one of the most busiest stores in the Valley, if we stood in front of Walmart with, a, with a, a, a clipboard and maybe a microphone and said, hey, would you like to go to heaven? How many people would say yes? How many people would say, no, I'd rather go to hell? Yeah. But Roman citizenship paled in comparison to being a member of the free state of heaven, and that's Paul's point. Our citizenship, as far as Christian citizenship is, it's in heaven, an infinitely greater citizenship than anything that is in this world. I am glad that I'm a citizenship, I'm a citizen of heaven. My citizenship is in heaven. I'm very happy about that. I'm very glad about that. And I didn't have to take a test to do it, right? I just had to be born into it. Amen? I wanted to mention Abraham for just a minute. This citizenship was so infinitely greater than anything in the world. It was Abraham's ultimate quest, right? Notice Hebrews 11. It was his ultimate quest. Hebrews 11, you probably already know where I'm going with this. Verse 8 and 10. Hebrews 11, 8 and 10, by faith. Abraham, when he was called, obeyed by going out to the place which he was to receive an inheritance. And he went out, not knowing where he was going. By faith he lived as an alien in the land of promise, as a foreign land, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, fellow heirs of the same promise. For he was looking for the city which has foundations, whose architect and builder is God. Notice verse 16. But as it is, they desire a better country. That is, a heavenly one. So it's all in the same context here. A better country, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. So here, the writer of Hebrews speaks of our heavenly citizenship, which is, a direct, which is in direct relationship to who I am in Christ. I am a citizen of heaven. Notice chapter 12. I think you want to turn one over, right? Chapter 12. 22 and 24. Says it, it too speaks of our citizenship that is in heaven. It says, but you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven, and to God. All those things and to God, amen? You get to heaven, you've come to all these things and God as well, amen? God is there, the judge of all, and to the spirits of righteousness that are made perfect. And to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant, and to the sprinkling of blood, which speaks better than the blood of Abel. And then one more in Hebrews chapter 13. Chapter 13. Verse 14. 
So let us go out to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. For we, for here we do not have a last, a lasting city, but we are seeking the city which is to come. Amen. The city which is to come, and this city that uh, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews thirteen fourteen, speaks of that one which is to come, spoken of here, is actually described for us uh, for us in Revelation twenty one. So I'd like you to go there, and would you? Would you give me the time to read the whole chapter? Could I do that? I know that's unorthodox in most churches today to read a whole chapter of Scripture. But uh, so much for orthodoxy, right? Or unorthodoxy. Let's just read the whole chapter. It's amazing. I read it, I read it, I read it the other day when I was finishing my notes. And I thought maybe this would be good just to read it, to see how great our citizenship will be in heaven. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there's no longer any sea. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, they'll no longer be any mourning and crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. And then he said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of water of life without cost. He who overcomes will inherit th these things. And I will bless his God, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and the unbelieving and the abominable and the murderers and immoral persons and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. And then one of the angels who had a seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain. And showed me the holy city, Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God. Heaven, the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone of crystal clear jasper. It had a great and high wall with twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels. And the names were written on them, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east, and three gates on the north, and three gates on the south, and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had twelve foundation stones. And on them were the twelve names of the uh, twelve apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, and it is, length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles. Its length and width and height are equal. So you have a square there. You have a square, a cube. The new heaven, the new earth, wherever God dwells, wherever that eternal state is, it's going to be 1,500 miles wide, high, and deep. It's a cube. It's larger than half the size of the United States. It's a cube. Can you imagine that? With rooms in it. Remember Jesus said, my father's house has many rooms? It's going to be like a giant cube hotel. Um, yeah. Not motel. Hotels are better, right? 19. Well, 18. The material of the wall was jasper. The city was pure gold like clear glass, never seen pure gold, clear glass like that. The foundation stones of the city were, walls were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third chalk. Does anybody know how to pronounce that? I'm sorry. Thank you. The fourth emerald, the fifth sardox, the sixth sardis, the seventh Crystal light, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth chrysophras, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. I saw no temple in it. And this is what I mean by the glory, the greatness, and value of heaven is the Lord Himself. And there was no temple in it, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or of the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its, lamb is the, and its lamp is the Lamb. 
The nations will walk by its light. And the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And the daytime, for, for there will be no night there. Its gates will never be closed. And they will bring the glory and the honor and the, of the nations into it. And nothing unclean, no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Amen? So we should probably get back to Ephesians chapter 20. Let's go back there and finish up. By the way, that was all introduction. Let's finish up, Paul, concerning who we are in Christ, that we're citizens of heaven. So back in Ephesians 3, 20 and 21, in the first part of verse 20, Paul makes it very clear then that the Christian citizenship is not of this world. You've seen those stickers on the back of cars, right? Not of this world. That's what he's talking about here. But of heaven, amen? And then he goes on to give us the means of our citizenship in the rest of 20 and 21. Notice it with me. First he says, from which also we eagerly wait for a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I saw that. I said, instead of the Savior, I saw a Savior. It means there's only one, amen? It implies access into heaven by way of a Savior. Why? Because we're sinners. Need of a Savior. There's only one way into heaven, forgiveness of sins. That's the only way in. And the only one way we can get that is a Savior, a Savior. The one in particular, the only one is who? Paul tells us, right? The Lord Jesus Christ. That's why Paul said, I know a man in Christ who went into the third heaven. The only way he went into the third heaven was by being a Christian. In other words, saved by the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's Lord Jesus Christ, Paul says in verse 21, that will transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory. So this is part and parcel of our heavenly citizenship, a transformed body. We always think that when we go to the cemetery and we leave our loved one there in that casket, or bury them in an urn, their ashes in an urn, we think that that's the end of it. It's not. If they're a believer in the Lord, in fact, everybody will be risen. God's not done with the body. Some unto under, under, eternal life, some unto eternal death. But the cemetery, that's temporary. It seems like it's forever. People have been in the grave for thousands of years, but it's temporary. It truly is. The Scripture's clear on that. It might sound weird and strange, but it's not in the context of Scripture, not at all. And so this is part and parcel of our heavenly citizenship, a transformed body, one like Christ after his resurrection, a physical body fit for eternity. That's what it's going to be, one that can appear and disappear, one that can pass through solid objects, one that can be felt and seen and handled, 1 John 1, can be heard, one that can eat, the apostle saw the Lord at the re after his resurrection. He, he sat down. He could eat. He could be felt. He could be touched. One that defies gravity. He went up into heaven without wings attached to his back. One that can be recognized. And as of yet, Paul refers to our body as it is now in our humble state. Think about that. Our body in its humble state. As he says, transform the body of our humble state. Humble because it's nothing like it's going to be when it's transformed. Amen? That's why it's humble. In comparison to what it's going to be, it is a lowly, humble, shameful thing. Our body. It really is. Right now it's fleshly. It's carnal. It's earthly. It's fallen. It's sinful. And it's dying. Our body is dying. Would you say amen? It is. It started dying the day it was conceived. It's dying. But in his transformed state, it will be glorious. As Paul put it, in conformity with the body of his glory. That's how our body is going to be in a transformed state. In conformity with the body of Christ's glory. Conformity kind of gives the idea of being similar in form and type. In other words, just like the one Jesus had. And when Paul says his glory, he means after the resurrection. Whatever that's going to be. A physical transformation is part of our overall glorification that will take place when we see Christ. Both soul or spirit, they're synonymous. Both soul or spirit and body will be glorified and equipped for eternity. So it won't be without the body forever. As the Lord 
gave it to us at birth. We're not going to be without it forever. We'll be out without it for a little while if we die. If we get raptured, we'll continue on with it. It's just going to be better. It's going to be better, whatever it is. I didn't see the Lord's transformed body, so I don't know what it's going to be like. But Paul saw it. Paul knows, and he's telling us it's a glorious thing to think about it. I'm just hoping that mine comes with a little bit more muscle on it, you know, a little more strength. But it won't be like the one we have now. Whatever Christ's glorified body was or is, we're going to have that. You know, some people teach, they taught in Paul's day that the, the body really had no value to it. You could abuse it if you wanted to. The Gnostics believed that. In their religion, they believed that they could abuse their body. They could even abuse it to the point of sexual sin because it didn't matter. And Paul's speaking of the contrary here. It's very important. The Lord's plan to glorify it or regenerate it or reconstruct it for eternity proves that. Proves that. God has great purpose and great value in the body. He gave his son a body on earth. He did. And he has that body today in heaven. So today our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 6.19. Again, a very good reason to treat it with care, honor, and respect. And not use it for dishonorable things, but I think we need to be reasonable we don't want to be guilty of idolatry, do we? We don't. Worshiping our bodies as the Romans did, and as a lot of people do today, the body is made into a god. It always has been. We don't want to do that. So we need to keep it in check, not as an object of worship, but something the Lord is going to use for his eternal and sovereign purposes, and then treat it like that, amen? Because our body is what? The temple of the Holy God, the temple of the Holy Spirit, it's a true fact. God lives in our body. It's amazing. Amazing. Well, we need to treat it well, knowing that this, this dying mass of flesh will someday be fitted for a kind of an eternal purpose in Christ. And how is that done? Well, Paul tells us there at the very end in verse 21, by the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. That's a theological mouthful, isn't it? It really is. But it means that the Lord will transform our humble body by the same power that enables him to bring all things under his control. The Lord Jesus Christ is sovereign God over the universe. And by that same power and authority, he will transform our body. The same way. We don't know how he'll do it. We don't know how God can take a... A, a body that's been in the grave for 4,000 years that's probably dust and turn it back into a, a body with flesh and bone like Jesus had. Remember he said flesh and bone. Does the spirit have flesh and bone? But he created the universe by just speaking it. So that same power that God used to create the universe, he'll use to raise up our bodies and make them perfect. Which is another way of saying that Jesus Christ is both God and Lord. And it has authority and power over the universe, both physical and spiritual, and all to his glory. And all God's people said, and this is who I am in Christ. I am a citizen of heaven. Amen? Let's pray. And it is a glorious thing. Truly a glorious thing. So I guess at this point, with your heads bowed and eyes closed, I, I'm, I'm sure the question is to ask, are you a citizen of the heaven? Are you, are you positive? Are you sure? I know even good Christians sometimes will doubt. I know that. And Paul said that the Lord knows those who are his. I understand that. But the, the, the Lord has given us plenty of, of information in the scriptures to be able to determine whether we are or we not. Are we not. And are we? What is the main, as far as our this morning's passage of Scripture is concerned, how all those that we looked at, how did they end up in heaven? Paul or Isaiah and anyone else for that matter. Because they had their sins forgiven. And that's, 
That's the reality. That's the hope of Christ. That our sins are forgiven. And it's, it's really not a matter of ritual like some people make it. Some religions make it a matter of ritual. It's not really a matter of ritual. It's a matter of faith. It's a matter of trusting by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's where your faith needs to be, in Christ alone, the Lord of the universe who will transform our, our humble bodies into a body that, which is like Christ. I think it's a good example of our fallen state. The body itself, because it's so fallen and corrupt, keeps us out of heaven. That, that in itself is a reason to want to be transformed through Christ or in Christ or by Christ. And if you're here today and you're not sure of your eternal destiny, if you're not sure if you're a card-carrying citizen of heaven, you can be sure. Simple. Say, just ask Jesus, forgive me. I'm a sinner. I know I am. And I desire access into heaven. I want to go to heaven when I die. Because you're there and a whole lot of other good reasons but mostly because I want to be with you forever in that new city. So if you're here today, you're not 100% sure and you want to make sure, then just with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, just make sure. Lord Jesus, I come to you and you alone by your grace, through faith that you give me in Christ alone. I ask for salvation. I ask for forgiveness of sins. You do that. And if you made that prayer today, or if you're praying that prayer today, or if you're thinking about that, you may, can, you may not make a decision today. You may just be thinking about it and think about it during the week and come back next week and hear more. I've seen people do that. They don't come to faith in Christ immediately. Sometimes it takes a while, and that's okay. God is sovereign in that. But if you're thinking about that or you've prayed that prayer, I just want you to come talk to me today or one of my elders. Just let us know you made a decision today for heaven, and we have some literature we want to get into your hands. I'll help you with your decision. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the power of your word and the presence of your Holy Spirit. It's so good to be in the house of the Lord and with your people, even though the numbers are down. It doesn't matter. You're here. What a blessing. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Amanda? Could you please rise for the final song? <laughs>